Hi, I'm Farangian. Welcome to my Ferris annealing video. What we're going to be talking about in this video is a technique for making ferrous metals, iron and steel, more malleable or workable. You've probably noticed that I'm specifying ferrous metals. That's because annealing for non-ferrous metals is a little different. There is another video on my YouTube channel that talks about non-ferrous annealing. There are a couple of other things I should mention. First, annealing iron and steel is a preparatory process for cold forming and shaping metal. This is not the hot working bang on your anvil technique. That's a whole different business. If you're planning on hammer work on iron or steel, you'll need to look at different resources for that. What we're doing here is getting a piece of metal softened so we can shape it with a saw or file. We're talking about the fine shaping and detail work that you can't do as effectively with a cross peen or your daddy persuader hammer. If you were making a knife, you would anneal it so that you can shape the cutting edge, put in a bevel, drill holes for rivets and pins, and other fine detail and finish work. You would then quench the blade to give it a proper hardness. I should also mention that for reasons of chemistry, aluminum anneals more like steel than other non-ferrous metals. Annealing aluminum tends to bring it a lot closer to the melting point, so it's a lot twitchier to anneal than iron or steel. I really avoid annealing aluminum when I can, and I usually can. For some alloys of titanium and other space-age metals, you might want to seek professional help. Seriously, there are some jobs you just don't want to take on in a home shop. Now, what are we doing when we're annealing? Metal has a crystalline structure. As metals are worked, or just sitting around if you leave them long enough, the crystals tend to get packed tighter and tighter. This makes the metal harder to work. If you push it long enough, the metal will actually crack and break. We usually don't want that to happen, so we apply the technique of annealing. We also anneal our metal because, in the long run, it cuts down on wear on our tools. This might not matter too much on things like jeweler's saw blades that are meant to be of a limited life, but I'd really like my shears, drills, and other metalworking tools to last as long as possible. Annealing is heating the metal to a critical temperature, but not so high that we actually melt the metal. This helps the molecules in the metal align nicely so that the metal is easier to work with. It can get tricky sometimes because the temperatures we are looking for can be hard to see, especially if you're kind of new to the process. With iron and steel, we have the added fun that the temperatures can really mess with the chemical and crystalline structure. There are actually different names for iron alloys depending on the chemical and crystalline structure and how it's been heated and cooled. The temperature we're looking for depends on the alloy or mixture of metals we're working with and what we want to do with them. There's no way that I can list the critical temperatures for every possible alloy here, so I won't. If you want to know a specific temp for a specific alloy, it's time to talk to the people who you got your metal from or check the internet. Usually we're looking for a color in the red range. Be wary of a bright red color. You're getting close to overheating your metal. If you get to orange, and especially if you start throwing sparks, you're past the mark and need to let the metal cool and start over. Fortunately, there is an easy test for iron and steel that will help you know when you've actually met the critical temperature. When you're at the critical temperature, a magnet will no longer stick to the metal. So if your steel is glowing and a magnet isn't attracted to it, you're there. Soldering isn't as common with iron and steel, but silver soldered or brazed joints are still possible so you might want to check for them before you anneal your metal. It would be no fun if someone used ticks or some other low temperature solder to put parts of a blade together, and then they fall apart on you just because you want to reshape the edge. Let's look at what we're annealing today. This is a large nail that I'm going to be cutting up to make some stamps. This piece of metal isn't as hard as, say, an old file, but we still want to soften it up before we work on it. Remember, if we were banging this into arrowheads or making a knife blade or something, that would be a different process. That would be hot working, not annealing. And that would be another video. Let's also look at the tools we're using. 
One of the most important is our work surface. Obviously, since we're working with heat, we want a surface that won't burn. That's why I've taught my work surface with these pavers. If you're going to do that or use any surface that's a bit porous, make sure it's dry before you start using your torch. Any water that's in the pores of the paver can easily be turned into steam by our torch. Steam in a confined space can create an energetic reaction, and we're here to do metal work, not to treat shrapnel wounds. That's another video. It would also be nice if the work surface would reflect heat back at your metal. That's why I work on this fire brick most of the time. This channel cut into the brick is useful when I'm making knife blades or steel stamps because it reflects heat back from the sides as well as the bottom. Second on our tool list is safety equipment. Leather gloves are a must. Personally, I like my welding gauntlets. Never use gloves with holes. Make sure you're wearing long pants and long sleeves, preferably cotton, wool, or leather. These materials are more likely to protect you from fire than polyester. Make sure you're wearing shoes, too, preferably leather. You also want eye protection, preferably with dark lenses. I've used darkened safety glasses, welding goggles, even sunglasses under a lab mask. The darkened lenses help you see what you're doing. A shady location will help with this, too, but it doesn't give you the second benefit of the darkened lenses keeping you from blinding yourself. As my welder friends say, don't look at the pretty blue light. Don't worry, what you're seeing in this video won't be harmful. Even if you decide the dark lenses aren't for you, do wear safety glasses or goggles, and not just your prescription glasses. A blacksmith friend of mine tells me that there are clear lenses with the designation Z87 that are designed to cut UV light which is the part of the torch flame that will damage your eyes. Now we get to our torch. Today I'm working with a propane air torch, but this torch is a step up from the plumber's torch I used in the non-ferrous video. It gets hotter and keeps the tank well away from my hot work. Air acetylene or propane oxygen with a big nozzle would work well for this, but they aren't absolutely necessary unless you're working with something fairly big. For annealing, I'd stay away from the big oxyacetylene rigs. We're annealing metal, not cutting holes in it. If you're old school or really lucky, you could use a coal or gas forge for annealing, but I don't have the space in this shop for one at the moment. We also want a way to light our torch. I use a flint and steel sparker. There are other systems, but I really suggest you avoid anything that would put explosive gas or your hand too close to the flame. Remember, this is annealing, not a paramedic video. In non-ferrous annealing, I stress using copper tongs to interact with our anneal piece. For ferrous annealing, we can go ahead and use the steel tongs or pliers. We won't be dragging any acid baths into this annealing process. We also won't be quenching the metal at this point. For ferrous metals and aluminum, we want the piece to cool slowly which is why I have my handy steel cylinder full of plaster dust. The hot piece goes in here and will cool down slowly. We'll have to brush the metal after, but a little plaster and a brush is a lot cheaper than new tools. I chose plaster for this project because it's easily available in local hardware and art supply stores. A blacksmith friend swears by another option. Instead of plaster, you can use wood ash. The wood ash will hold the heat for a long time. We're talking eight hours or more. This gives the metal a really long, slow cook, which really helps soften up the metal. The last piece of our equipment is the one we hope we don't need, our fire extinguisher. Okay, enough said on that. Okay. So today we are going to be annealing this nail, which I'm going to be using as stock to make some stamps for some future metal work. Now when we're working on this, you will notice that my nail fits nicely on the block. 
if we're using the file here, this guy is a little bit bigger, a little bit longer, and he's going to hang over the block. That means two things to us. One, less of the metal has heat getting reflected back at it from the block, and you're going to have to worry about if you carry over the end, is there something down here that will burn? And we don't want to set things on fire, so you keep as much of the metal on the block as possible, and you keep an eye on where your torch is at all times. Now, this nail also you can use a little bit smaller torch because it's not radiating as much heat. And on the nail you don't have to worry about plastic parts. This file, if it had had a plastic handle on there, that plastic you need to make sure it all is off so you're not giving off poisonous fumes. We're also counting ourselves lucky that we are not dealing with aluminum, because with aluminum, as you're heating this end, all the heat's going racing down this way, making it harder to get up to temperature. It's just radiating, 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 and not getting up to our temperature that we want for annealing. So you want to heat as much as you can, as quickly as you can, and keep as much of the object under the torch as possible. With steel, it's a little bit more forgiving. The heat stays a little bit more where we want it, so it is easier. One of the reasons I prefer annealing steel to aluminum. But you still want to work as much as possible, as quickly as possible. If we had something really big, like say the size of my four pavers here, you might actually want to bring in multiple torches, or use a good old gas oven type setup or a charcoal forge or something like that. Some of those really do make things easier but we're working with a gas torch right now because gas torches are easier to come by. If somebody asks nicely maybe my dad and I get together and we make a video about annealing with a coal forge. But that's a project for another day. Now we make sure our striker is ready get anything that will burn off the heat surface. To light our torch, we will open the valve at the tank. Make sure our tank is safely away and not going to fall over or any problems like that. Now we will open the valve on the torch. We hear gas coming out, which is a good thing. We put this into the striker over the torch and then create a flame. Now actually I got a pretty good setting on this one already. Oh, will kill that one. And we want a nice blue flame with a nice blue cone in the center. We don't want a whole lot of this orange feathering going on. So this creates a good oxidizing flame for us. And we're going to start just working the piece over some before we really start focusing in because we want to get whole things start getting happy and get heated up. Your sweet spot for your heat is actually at the end of the inner blue cone. So you don't want to squash your flame down like that or be hanging way out here. You just want the end of that blue cone to be kind of licking them up. Because we're here to eat metal, we're not here to waste gas. It gets hard sometimes when we're doing this to avoid reaching in for things, which that's one of the reasons you wear your gloves, to protect yourself in case you do something silly. Okay, see this end here has now started to get a nice little glow on it. It means it's about where we want it, and we can start working our way down the shaft of the nail. Remember, anytime you're pulling the torch out of the way to check the color of the metal, you're actually letting it cool down. 
So you try not to do that too often. This is one of those things that experience helps. It also helps if you have tinted glasses and a little bit of shadow in the area you're working in because those things help you actually see the heat coming off the metal. And you can see the shaft has a glow on it working down. So as we're working towards this end, it should be relatively faster because that end has now got plenty of heat in it. And after I've got the cool thing up to temperature, I tend to like to just work it, give it one more nice little once over to make sure that everybody's up to temperature and everybody's happy. This end will go very quickly because basically that heat has nowhere to go and except into areas that are hot already. You can see the orange on our brick where it's really blasting the heat back at the torch. And I should say at the moment. And that's one of the advantages of working on the heat reflective surface of the fireplace. It's bouncing back heat that would have been wasted otherwise. So we now have our whole nail that's hit red. Which means we have to pull out of pyro mode for a second here. Think about what we're doing. We're going to turn off our torch so that it's safe. And then we're going to go get our pliers because we don't want to give ourselves a permanent brand or tattoo. And then we are going to put our nail down into our plaster. Now even if it has stopped being red, that nail is still very hot. We're going to let him stay here in the plaster for a while to have a nice slow cool down and relax. This is the point you go on to working on another piece or working on something else. Okay, we're back in the shop after we have let this cool. We're going to pull out our nail, and you can see a little plaster is coming out with them. That's okay. We will just refill the can later. And here's our, here's our nail, unharmed, but softer and ready to be worked with. Now, after I've made stamps with this, I'm going to want to harden it again, but that is actually a different process, and we'll cover that in a different video. And. That's it for the basics of annealing ferrous metal. I'm Ferangian, and this has been my ferrous annealing video. If you've got anything to say about the video, leave a comment. For more information and other useful videos, go to my YouTube channel, or visit my blog at wordsmeanstuff.wordpress.com.